Hello. So this video is going to be about Femi Osifisan's play, Women of Owu. Now, as I said in my video on Osifisan's, uh, Who's Afraid of Solarin, Osifisan is one of my absolute favorite playwrights, and he is one of contemporary theater's great adapters, both great in the sense of uh, the quantity of adaptations he's done, and great in the sense of the inventiveness and creativity that he brings to those adaptations. And Women of Owu is a great example of this. Uh, he takes uh, Euripides' play, The Trojan Women, uh, which is a story, a story, it's a, it's a lament, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a lament by uh, the survivors of the Trojan War. The women of Troy who are captured and are being divided as slaves amongst the Greeks. And Osifisan takes this story and he resets it in West Africa in 1821 when the city-state of Oru was sacked by a coalition of its enemies. But this play premiered in 2004 and Osifisan also makes this an extremely topical play. As he says in the note on the play's genesis, so it was quite logical, therefore, that as I pondered over this adaptation of Euripides' play in the season of the Iraqi war, the memories that were awakened in me should be those of the tragic Owu war. And so here we have these three points coming into contact with one another. We have Euripides' play about the Trojan War. We have the Iraq War, which was in its early years in 2004, but was already quite unpopular in the United Kingdom where this play premiered. And we have the war in Owu in 1821. Uh, so Eur Euripides and uh, the war in Owu form the basic plot components of this, but a lot of the ideological elements, the political agenda here, is very much the anti-Iraq war agenda. So one of the big things that we have here is a, a very vicious satire of the rhetoric of the war on terror, especially the rhetorics of liberation, bringing freedom to the people of Iraq and Afghanistan and things like this. Um, and most of this is put into the mouths of the women of the chorus. Some of it is given to um, uh, some of it is given to Irula Afin, uh, who is Basically, the Helen figure, or sorry, uh, the 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 Hecuba figure. Uh, so uh, Hecuba in Euripides is uh, the the widow of Priam, former queen of the the Trojans, and the leader of the women who have survived. Here, Erula uh, uh, Afin plays the same kind of role. She's the sort of lead figure among these these captured women but i want to give you just a few examples of this sort of satire of war on terror rhetoric um so a couple at the beginning of the play a couple of women meet the god under the bow who is supposed to be the patron and protector of owu and he does not know what has happened to the city uh, so they tell him, without knowing that it's Angubao in uh, in disguise, they say, they describe the invasion, saying, they said our Oba was a despot, Oba being the king, uh, that they came to free us from his cruel yoke. So for seven years they camped outside our walls, but were unable to enter until yesterday when a terrible fire engulfed the city and forced us to open our gates. Um, so we've got that description. We've also got sort of we've got that element of they said our Oba was a despot. They said our king was a despot. Um, we also get this 
later on we have two women speaking here and I'll sort of indicate just with a finger when we shift from one woman to the other woman. Um, nowadays when the strong fight the weak it's called a liberation war to free the weak from oppression. Nowadays in the new world order it is suicide to be weak. So again we've got this sort of this rhetoric of liberation, this rhetoric of freedom, this rhetoric of uh, national self-determination that's ironically used during the, the war on terror when what actually happens is bombing, invasions of countries, destruction of infrastructure, destruction of social stability, uh, the eradication of cultural life, and so on and so on. And so that's a big component of this play, is th the satire of that. But the other component of this satire is that so much of the, the war on terror was about getting access to Iraqi oil for US and, and UK and coalition interests. Critics, uh, critics of the invasion very often argued that there was an economic profit motive behind it. And we get that in Women of Owu as well. So this is a lengthy section, and again, when we when we we do have one bit from Irula here, and I'll I'll mention that. But other than that, we shift from woman to woman in the chorus, and so I again give you the sort of one finger indicator when we move. So we start with a woman who says, "Liars, you came, you said to help free our people from a wicked king. Now after your liberation, here we are with our spirits broken and our faces swollen." waiting to be turned into whores and housemaids in your towns. I too curse you. And we have a ruler. It says, Savages, you claim to be more civilized than us, but, di but did you have to carry out all this killing and carnage to show you are stronger than us? Did you have to plunge all these women here into mourning just to seize control of our famous Apuma market, known all over the for its uncommon merchandise? So we've got that that economic motive, that profit motive of seizing their market. And then we have the chorus of women who, move, uh, who, who share this speech, giving this central idea. No, Arula, what are you saying, or are you forgetting? They did not want our market at all. They are not interested in such petty things as profit, only in lofty, lofty ideas like freedom or human rights. Oh, the Ajebus have always disdained merchandise. The Ifes are unmoved by the glitter of gold. The Oyos have no concern whatsoever for silk or ivory. All they care for, my dear women, all they care for, all of them, is our freedom. Ah-an-lug-bao, bless their kind hearts. Bless the kindness which has rescued us from tyranny in order to plunge us into slavery. Sing, my friends, let us celebrate our new one freedom of chains. So, like... Like Greek tragedy, we have a choral moment here. We have a choral element, but this is, and I mean, you could see as I was reading that, how much that, how much that speech divided between as many as 10 women, 10 speakers, you can see how much that flowed together and sounded like a unified choral speech. And I'd imagine in performance, that's the way that you want it to seem. You want it to seem like one unified speech. But we, again, we've got that sort of satire of the rhetoric of freedom, liberation, etc. used to disguise a blatant profit motive alongside the disavowal of that profit motive. <clears throat> but, sorry, but the other thing that's really interesting in this bit here is the last two lines uh, where a woman says, sing my friends, let us celebrate our new one freedom of chains, and then they, re they resume a dirge. And the reason that that's significant is because one of the things Osifisan does throughout 
women of Owu is he incorporates a number of Yoruba songs and chants and dirges. And these are significant because they offer the women of Owu a way to maintain their culture in the face of this invasion. We actually get some gestures at this. Um, the Rilu at one point says, Ah, raise your dirges again without trembling, even if for the last time, women. It's much better than our needless questions. Start the song. For those who survive, there's always another day. At which point they begin a dirge. And then slightly later, the chorus leader says, No, my friend, you don't understand. Nowhere will it ever be pleasant to be a slave. All we can is counter misfortune with our spirit and our will. So let us dance, my friends, as we wait, as our mothers taught us to do in such moments. Dance the dance of the days of woe. So these songs, these dances, these dirges, these chants, they are a way for the women of Owu to maintain their culture and almost to overcome their captivity, to resist the destruction of their culture alongside the destruction of their city.